The Lou Hutt Show continues with your host, entrepreneur, CPA, lawyer, and author, Lou Hutt. Millennials. Everybody is intrigued with trying to kind of understand the impact that millennials are going to have on uh, business, products, technology, lifestyles. It's an intriguing subject, and it's elusive. I mean, you know, major companies are investing tons of money, billions of dollars, trying to understand, trying to figure out, because they realize that the old way of promoting their product or delivering service um, has got to change. Even politically, millennials are different. Frankly, it is freaking refreshing. And my guest is, frankly, a scholar on this subject. Ravi Huddingson. Ravi, good morning and thanks for joining me. Good morning, Lou. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I mean, listen, you've studied this here. Let me just throw out a couple of thoughts. And, and then I want you to put it into context for me. The folks that we're talking about, birth dates between 1982 and 2000, right? About 83 million in terms of population. I didn't realize this, but 40% of millennials are parents. Yeah. <laughs> and How did that happen? I know, I know. These <laughs> folks. <laughs> hey, hey, Robbie, and listen, 88% of millennials live in metropolitan areas, so they're, they're urban dwellers. Yep. And 35% of them have bachelor's degrees or higher. Yep. This is the stage, Robbie, for what? Well, you know, big question. And when you just think about some of the statistics that you put out, yeah, it's the largest generation on the planet today. And uh, indeed, there's, they're uh, gravitating towards cities, and so therefore they're the most you know, global citizens that we've ever seen. And uh, 35% with bachelor's degrees, uh, you know, this is the most educated generation mm. we've ever had on the planet. So, you know, when we put it in perspective with all of the other generations, uh, you know, we, we can then really see where where these guys are headed and where this generation is taking us. And, you know, you, you mentioned in the intro there that I studied it. I actually lived it. You know, I was the guitar player for the band Hanson back in 1997. So this was the wow. birth of the generation. We were, wow. you know, the, one of the first millennial bands on the planet. And I'm a generation Xer. I was the old guy in the band. But, well, and, well, well, speaking of that, I mean, you, you're, you, you also work for the State Department as a cultural diplomat. Yeah, How did I you, do a lot of projects. I, I mean, listen, man, you, I mean, you are, diverse in your career <laughs> and i mean and, and is this how you all of a sudden stumbled up and said wait a minute you know i i'm i'm a product of the product and, and maybe i ought to take a stab at really trying to put connect the, the the dots in terms of what people are trying to figure out as it relates to millennials well absolutely you know i mean what what uh happened to me coming out of the out of the, you know, as I said, one of the first millennial bands on the planet is that in 2008, when the economy crashed, uh -huh. uh, I decided to pivot and I became a pilot and I joined the aviation industry. And this was an industry that didn't know how to track millennials. There was a shrinking pilot population. So I used my experience from the band to help the industry grow their pilot population. And, um, and what did you introduce? I mean, how did you just give us two or three initiatives that you th found were helpful? Well, you know, what was so crazy about it is that in looking at this and in analyzing the situation, one of the things I learned about millennials is that their number one priority is music. And, of course, that was my background. Wow. But get this, but get this statistic. I found out that 49.7% of pilots, okay, half of the pilot population actually plays a musical instrument. Heck, U.S. Census, it's only 8%. Wow. So there was a really high crossover, and I realized that this was the bridge. Uh, huh. that could really help the aviation industry connect with the millennial generation. I mean, this is a generation that consumes music unlike now, any now, other. That, that's fascinating. So if I were an employer 
in aviation and interested in rebuilding my ranks, uh, I'd probably come up with a pitch that would involve music? Yeah, absolutely. And this is true in all in many different industries. You know, it's not just aviation. I speak, uh, you know, I'm a keynote speaker now for corporations, and I also work a lot in education. Mm. And there's a teacher shortage in this country. But one of the things that many educators do, and I ask in every audience, is they play music. And if we bring music, culture, and arts back into education, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more teachers gravitating towards it, too, because standardized testing is not one of, you know, it's not something that's attracting a lot of new generation into the profession. So it is these creative outlets. It is the music. It is the culture. This is also why I serve as a cultural diplomat for the State Department, because, you know, we're entering an age of AI and globalization. We're looking at 40 percent of jobs, almost 40 percent of jobs. Hey, Robbie, you got to break down AI because, you know, some of us are listening to this and what it, what it, what it, what is Robbie referring to? Yeah, well, good. Uh, thank you for catching that, because we're talking about technology. And when mm -hmm. we're talking about AI, we're talking about artificial intelligence, which is when technology starts creating technology. And, you know, it becomes a, a, a crazy time because our jobs are going to be automated. And uh, Pew Research tells us, uh, you know, close to 40 percent are going to be automated in the next decade. Wow. So, now, 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 let me ask you, and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining me, uh, my guest is Ravi Huddington. And and Ravi, among many things, as mentioned, he told you about being a band. He's been a cultural diplomat with the United States, with the U.S. Department of State. He has been around. He's a millennial himself. We're talking about the subject of millennials and their unique, frankly, set of, 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 of lifestyles and, and, and ultimately what I what I want to also talk to you about with millennials is 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 just their money management uh, yeah. uh, te techniques. But before we get there, uh, millennials are also more uh, receptive and more engaged in the gig economy mm -hmm. than people probably realize. Talk to us on that level. Yeah. So when we look at um at millennials, right? We, we, we hear all the complaints that, you know, they don't, they're not loyal and that they don't stay in, in corporations. And by the way, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm just, I'm a little bit older than, but this okay. middle, we're the small Gen X. So we either gravitate <laughs> towards the baby boomers or we gravitate towards the millennials. Hey, you, you're right. Gravitate toward. toward the millennials. Stay with the younger yeah. crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when it really comes to their mentality on money and, and investing, for example, you know, mm -hmm. This is not a generation that invests for the future. And I believe that's because, you know, in 2008, they watched their parents get those pensions taken away, wow. you know, that they were relying on. This yes. is, this is, they were told, you know, you go to this preschool, you'll graduate Harvard, and mm. you'll have a job. Well, they went to that preschool. They went into debt going to Harvard, and then there was no job. So this is a generation that just says, you know, I'm not – going to invest in the future because the future is not guaranteed but wow. i'm going to focus on now and that's where the gig economy comes in because okay. these guys are going to jump from job to job because as you said earlier in your broadcast today you said you know we're living longer than we've ever lived before yes and uh you know the director on lab on aging at harvard medical school he uh -huh. says that the first person to live to 150 has already been born wow so, if we think about that, if we think about having a hundred years of productive life, you know, in one's lifetime, yeah, it's going to take a little longer to figure out what you want to do, and you're going to spend more time trying to figure out, figure that out. And so these these millennials, they are going to jump around from job to job. They are going to explore life more, and you know that maybe does lead to what you were also saying earlier: happiness, right? Happiness equals longevity of life. You know, uh, 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 Robbie, I um. It's interesting. And, and even with, as you say, uh, millennials being far more engaged and receptive, uh, I guess in the old days, they would say being a freelancer, uh, <laughs> doing gigs. Um, yep. I also learned that more than a third of millennials actually have a financial plan compared to only about 18% 
of baby boomers and 21% of generation Xers. Yeah. So these folks, while it may be kind of in our way of thinking, loosey goosey, they really do have a strategy. Well, they have a plan out of necessity. I mean, this is also the generation that's carrying the most debt. Mm. And they know that they've got to somehow get out of debt. So money's really important, no doubt. Money's really important to them. But it's also a generation that's driven by purpose. Ah. So in some ways, there's a bit of a conflict there. But, you know, when we look at what's happening in the world, uh, the future is going to be driven by purpose more than profits because of technology, because of of the things that are happening. So they they may have this right. They may have this whole equation right, that purpose is ultimately going to drive profit. Speaking of which, purpose, I mean, they seem to be more connected, and obviously social media allows that, but they're more um, focused on experiences and I said yep. years ago, we're in an experienced economy. And and what I also learned is that when it comes to dining and eating out and uh, and even buying coffee, expensive coffee, what we might consider expensive coffee, millennials are more inclined toward that than folks that are older who might just sort of discount like, ah, well, we eat at home. but. Millennials right. are, you know, they, they sort of like eating out. They like getting together and congregating. Is that a reflection of being in the technology age as well as just being young? Or what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of, of it. You know, I've done a lot of thinking about this and writing on my blog at RobbieUnites.com about all of these different characters. What's that, what's that blog again? Say it again, Robbie, very slow. RobbieUnites.com. Okay. That's my website, and the blog is right up there. Robbie Unites, just trying to bring people together, Lou. You know, yes, that's what it's all absolutely. about. <laughs> and um, and and what you were, what you're saying is true. You know, everybody's very critical about this generation. Saying, mm. you know, they're they're all they're doing is looking in their phones, and I and I keep telling people they're not looking at their phones; they're looking through their phones because the world is on the other side. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a very different mentality. And the result is, is that we're seeing that pendulum now starting to swing back where they're wanting more face-to-face interaction. They're wanting okay. real social interaction. Look, the telephone as a way of talking to each other, yeah. that's probably a thing of the past. I don't think that's going to come back. But wow. video conferencing for sure is going to be around for a while. And that face-to-face meeting, going out and getting that you know, special coffee that's, that, that they like or going out to eat, all the things that you're talking about are becoming more real because as we get further away from each other due to technology, humanity prevails and wants to bring us back. That's comforting. <laughs> uh, I believe. Well, well, let me, you know, and I guess the folks that uh, in the real estate industry would kill me if I didn't ask them and if I didn't put on the table that millennials are also sort of going in a different direction regarding home ownership. 37%. Between 25 and 34 own homes. Now that's compared to 45 percent of baby boomers at the same age. Right. So um, this. Yeah. So let, let me speak to that. So I, I gave the keynote last. I think it was last year for the National Association of Realtors, mm-hmm. and I gave my speech called Millennial Mojo, talking about the magic of millennials, right? Uh, and how to understand them for the exact reasons that you brought up. But it's actually pretty simple math. Look, if we go back to that idea that this is the generation that's going to live to 150, mm-hmm. it's not that they're not buying homes. It's that they're going to do it a little bit later in life. So mm. you never really look at and compare the baby boomers to the millennials at the same age right. because the trajectory of their lifespan and therefore the pace at which they're going to live is just simply different. So these, this generation is going to buy homes. They will, yes. but it's consistent with the gig economy and everything else that we're talking about. It's going to take them longer to settle down because they're going to have to settle down for a longer period of time. Wow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, listen, if you just join the show, my uh, special guest, Ravi Huddy Singh, is um, uh, uh, giving us, frankly, some insights 
on uh, the way millennials think, their motivations, their aspirations. And, you know, as, as we talk about these things, you know, Robbie, it sort of makes me do a gut check, you know? And I said, wait a minute, you know, these millennials may be really on to something, even as it relates to housing. Now, but I'm going to tell you what really caught my attention. I, I was thinking about this and, and I, I found some information that says millennials are also way ahead in terms of destigmatizing mental health mm. and mental health challenges. I've read that about a half of millennials, 70, uh, half of millennials have quit their jobs, not because they wanted to go in the gig economy, but for mental health reasons. Mm. And so this tells me that, it, it, and I can't wait to hear what you think about this, but millennials are not going to sit around and, and be kicked around and, and made to feel bad and down and that they're just not going to be taken advantage of if they're not feeling that their needs emotionally and so forth are being addressed in the work environment. Talk to me. Yeah. Well, we're seeing this in schools too, where now there are mental health things. And, you know, this is a lot of this pressure has been put on by the millennials who are the parents, not the students, right? They're mm, the parents and yes. the teachers. So the millennials are basically saying, you know, my kid, needs a mental health day and they're not ashamed to say it mm. uh and and you're right they're destigmatizing which is so so important in our society yes uh, that we start to destigmatize uh, mental health and recognize and treat it and embrace it because you know stress is a reality of absolutely life and, and, and the impact that has on on our lives and on our society cannot be understated so our ability to deal with it is only, uh, you know, as strong as our ability to acknowledge it and talk about it. And so this is a generation that uh, not only on mental health, but on all social injustices. You know, this is this is a generation Thank that's you. putting it all out there on the table, you know, from racism to LGBT to to all of these issues that that matter. Uh, hey, 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 and you're right. Hey, Robbie, home. Robbie, you're right. They look at you like, what the hell is your problem? What's your hang up? Yeah. Oh, 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 somebody is a different ethnic group or nationality or race. What? The, I mean, and what's the point? Yeah. You know, I often say in my keynotes to my audiences, you know, when you compare the baby boomers to the millennials, you know, the baby boomers grew up at a time of segregation. Mm. Millennials grew up during Obama. And they're not impressed that we had an African-American president. They think it's normal. And that's <laughs> yeah, progress. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's good. That's refreshing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, why should they be impressed? That's normal. Why can't an African-American rise to the top uh, office? You know, that makes plenty of sense. And, you, you know, uh, all of these things, homosexuality was a disease, but now LGBT is part of the regular conversation. I believe that this generation will organically help us grow out of many social injustices. And wow. mental health is one of them, for sure. Wow. There is uh, obviously this, uh, this other uh, challenge <laughs> because of the millennial generation that businesses generally are faced with. Yeah. And one is that millennials make roughly 54% of their purchases online. Mm -hmm. So if you got a brick and mortar retail and you don't have the capacity or you haven't invested in an online platform that appeals to millennials, you could find yourself out of business in no time. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, I'm writing a book right now called Pivot, and it's really to help companies understand the pivot that they need to make mm. in order to stay relevant in this age and, and with this new generation and, and beyond. I mean, Gen Z right behind them, which is going to be even bigger and probably, you know, even more like this. Uh, you know, you, we have to pivot. All of us have to pivot in order to really stay relevant. And, you know, shopping online, let's, we all do it. It's so convenient. Why wouldn't we do it? You know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. You can't fight technology. You can't fight convenience. You have to pivot in order to accommodate it. 
So if a brick and mortar store wants to stay in business, it's, you know, maybe what companies like Starbucks has done. And maybe that's a good example just off the top of my head because people go there for coffee, but they're purchasing coffee, they're purchasing mugs, they're purchasing music, they're purchasing all sorts of wow. things that are sold in Starbucks, but they're going there for the experience. They're going there for that social interaction or to be seen or whatever, whatever it is. It's what they cannot get online. They can get. Hey, wait a minute, Robbie, you just, wait a minute. I think you cracked the code. (laughs) If you're in business, you got to figure out what it is you cannot, the experience that most people, whether they're millennial generation X, baby boomers, they yearn for, but you can't really extract it from an online kind of encounter. Because there's right. still that human side that we still thrive for that interaction, that feely touchy, that uh, let me see you, let me kind of be with you in your presence kind of thing. And, and and maybe for many companies, you, you know, you, you, you're touching on something that could be transformative. Yeah, you know, I think so. And, you know, when we look back at, uh, you know, you mentioned that the millennials, you know, they, they – uh, their birth years were up until about 2000. You know, it's funny because that that's changed to some degree. You know, mm. They're re they're reevaluating it based on sometimes based on what you want to prove. You change the age group, uh-huh. but also you know what they're saying is that um, if you don't remember 9/11, you weren't a millennial. It's not enough to have been wow. born during 9/11, but if you don't remember it, uh, you know it's 9/11. So so they're making the millennials a little bit older than Mm -hmm. um, the birth years that you did. But I would argue, and I would pull that back. I would go against that. Because to me, what a bigger indication of the millennial generation is, is what happened in the late 90s. We went to a sharing economy when this thing called the Internet came out. Yes. And that completely changed our economy from peer-to-peer networks. What, What happened then is we went from financial capital to social capital. Hmm. And social capital is what drives the economy today. Now, so, now break that down. Just I mean, I've only mm-hmm. got about a minute. Tell me, okay. what do you mean by social capital? Social capital means that our network is our net worth, right? I Woo! Mean, it is about our, our network. network is our net worth. Yep. Wow. Yep. <laughs> what a <laughs> fascinating. So what you do with that network, how you cultivate it, how you nurture it, yeah, so how you leverage it. Look at, what, look at what happens online with all these peer-to-peer reviews. And that's, that's, what, that's what drives our shopping habits. It's not what's being marketed to us, yes. but what our peers are telling us. And if we can recreate those conversations or facilitate those conversations in a, in a brick-and-mortar social experience, that's the future of brick-and-mortar. Yeah, and and, and you know what? Question. Proof of the pudding is, look at shopping centers across America. Yep. They have to transform and they have to stay relevant. They have to offer experiences within the shopping mall that are different than just selling merchandise. Absolutely. It's all about the experience. This is, as you said, an experience economy. It's a sharing economy. It's a generation that values experiences over everything else. What's that website again, Robbie? Because you have just, I mean, you sparked so many questions and, and, and revelations, frankly. I'd, I'd love to learn more. What's that website again? Well, thank you, Lou. Yeah, my website is RobbieUnites.com. That's R-A-B-I-U-N-I-T-E-S.com. And, of course, I'm all over social media on every platform at Robbie Unites. Hey, Robbie, appreciate you being here. We'll have you back again soon. Thank you, Lou. Looking forward to it. All the best. Lou Hatcho, ladies and gentlemen, hour number two, right around the corner.